All right, so last week uh, we watched The Defenders because it had been featured in Mad Men and we were like, oh, we should go check out that show. And then in the course of talking about The Defenders, which is a courtroom show, we ended up talking about Perry Mason a lot, <laughs> you know, as compared, because uh, in The Defenders, it's like these difficult uh, moral quandaries. It's not a clear cut case of who's right and who's wrong, where Perry Mason uh, famously never lost a case. <laughs> Apparently, like there were a couple episodes where his def his uh, client would be found guilty, but then he would go find some extra bit of evidence just in time to save them from death row. And that was like two or three times. Usually it didn't even get that far. He just wins. He always wins. But we thought just to compare and contrast, let's watch some Perry Mason. So you got any, uh, I don't know, what's your, what's your Perry Mason? My take on Perry Mason. Perry Mason was the first thing that I would have seen in, in of those legal type shows. And as a result, when I, I would have been a kid about, I don't know, nine-ish, ten-ish, whatever, I kind of thought I might become a lawyer. Of course, and I changed my mind like who knows how many times, but guess what I am today? Right. A lawyer. <laughs> so it's 100%. So thank you, Perry. <laughs> yeah. You can totally thank Perry Mason. <laughs> so yeah, I guess Perry Mason, a criminal defense lawyer, featured in 82 novels by Earl Stanley Gardner starting in 1933. So it's, again, not surprising, but I never know where these things come from. So it's like, oh, that makes sense that he came from somewhere, but I didn't know that. And uh, as also is the case with a lot of these early TV shows we've watched, this character was adapted for motion pictures and a long-running radio series. But the best-known adaptation was the CBS television series starring Raymond Burr. It ran from 1957 to 1966 with 271 episodes. So this is where I started getting confused because for me, I am not really familiar with Perry Mason. I just know the name. But... In my mind, just floating around is just these things I'm, I've heard of, but I've never really delved into, was Perry Mason and Matlock. They, to me, were sort of the same. So when I was reading that, I was like, why would I conflate those two things if the Perry Mason show ran from 1957 to 1966 and Matlock was in the 80s? It's not, it's not usual for me to be off by 30 years. That's weird. But then I found out it's because they then made a bunch of Perry Mason television films, also starring Raymond Burr, from 1985 to 1995. So that's what I'm thinking of. Oh, okay. Well, so, I can't say I, I knew that. Yeah, so you know young Perry Mason. I knew old, old Matlock-adjacent Perry yeah. Mason. <laughs> so we're both talking about the same character and the same actor, but from the two different runs. And then uh, Raymond Burr passed away in 1993, so he wasn't in all of those movies, but most of them. So... So yeah, he did well with old Perry Mason, and it was a super successful show, won a ton of awards. And this is one of these shows that is famous enough that you could read about it forever. There's so many details. So rather than dig through 60 million details, I thought it'd just be better, let's just watch it. <laughs> you know? Sure. And uh, in those days, he would have had his secretary, uh, Della Street, and uh, oh, who was the private investigator that he had who helped him resolve these cases? Blonde-haired guy. Tall, good looking. Uh, Drake, Drake, I uh, can't remember his first name, but I'm sure we'll see both of them in whatever it is we're going to watch. Yeah, so I found the very first episode of the show, The Case of the Restless Redhead, Perry Mason, season one, episode one. And uh, I was saying, like, there's just way too many details to, to dive through, but the one thing I did uh, kind of notice that seemed interesting is this is an early enough show that it was originally intended to be broadcast live, you know? They would do those old shows where they just performed them, kind of like a play. And this was the first, uh, I believe this is the first, like, hour-long drama that they filmed more like they do uh, a modern show. And they did that for uh, a couple of reasons. First off, it was just the style now was moving toward that. But also, it would have just been an incredible workload on Raymond Burr to do this show live because he's in almost every scene. Like, 98% of all scenes have Perry Mason in them. So to, to just do that live would be... Apparently, it was already a fantastic amount of work he was doing what while the show was running. What is the show he... Oh, Ironsides. Did you ever hear of that show? Raymond Burr did... Ironsides. He's in a some kind of cowboy he's show. In a wheelchair. No, no. Oh. <laughs> no, he, I guess not. He's he's a he's in a wheelchair. And is he a? I don't think he's a lawyer. In it, I I never really saw very uh, Ironsides, but I, 
but it would have been like late in his career in the 80s. Okay. So I was uh, going to say, I've only heard of Ironsides really as an insult. Yeah, no. Like that's a, <laughs> it's a way to make fun of people in wheelchairs. No, he's he is in a wheelchair and he's either... He might be a lawyer. If not, if not, he's a police, uh, you know, high up. Ironsides, American television crime drama, aired on NBC for eight seasons from 1967 to 1975. So yeah, it was in between after the first Perry Mason and before they started making those movies. Show starred Raymond Burr as a consultant for the San Francisco Police Department, oh. paralyzed from the waist down while being shot. So yeah, there you go. Although, what was he? before he got shot let's see yeah so he was a former detective and then he got paralyzed so he's just a uh, what a strange uh, strange concept for a show <laughs> but we might have to check out an Ironside show yeah maybe uh, in the meantime though Perry Mason which uh, yeah and again like I said I didn't dig too much into the details but yeah this show was super successful won tons of awards and uh, even at uh, the cancellation point I guess Raymond Burr himself, he kept trying to get out of it. He agreed to do like five years and then he stayed on for like nine. They just kept bringing him back. And then uh, it was hitting the point where they were going to change to color. And he was like, I don't know, maybe this is just a good time to fucking wrap this up. But he agreed to one more year and then they canceled it anyway. But maybe because he was and so he had an impact on young viewers who some of them went on and became lawyers. <laughs> yeah, and presumably, I mean, we'll see how the case of the restless redhead goes, but instead of the uh, moral ambiguity of uh, the defenders, I think in this case, we can look forward to... Uh, Successful conviction. Exactly. Of the real criminal. Forgotten this music. Oh, I've heard that song. Yeah. There, his, uh, his, his, go for it. Mr. Mix, I can't thank you enough. Well, Mr. Aldrich did. This is for not implicating Helene Cheney and for clearing Aldrich of a murder charge. So I think the funniest thing about that is that is exactly how you described last week when we were watching The Defenders and how it's more of a organic kind of realistic situation where you were saying in most of these court type shows, you know, they they filibust, the lawyer says all this crazy conjecture shit, doesn't really get called on it, and then the criminal goes, I did it, you're right, I did it. And that's exactly what happened <laughs> in this episode. <laughs> Yeah, pretty, 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 pretty standard formula for Perry Mason. Yeah, so I mean, it's a really well-made show, and it does kind of, it actually feels a lot like movies of the time, like very high budget, high quality. But as for and the... It, and uh, it's got a lot of stuff in it. There was a, in an hour. That, but see, that's what I don't like about it. I don't like these ridiculously circuitous, just this coincidence, and this leads to this, and this leads to that. Halfway through, I tapped out. My brain was just like, I don't know, and I don't care. <laughs> oh, oh, no, see, no, I love that kind of stuff, because you're always second-guessing it. Like, how did they figure that out? Now, of course, some information came in at the end that we had no access to, so you couldn't say, oh, yeah, I should have guessed it because I knew about that. Uh, that's one thing about this. All kinds of information comes out at the end about how he came to his conclusions. But there's no way the audience could come to that conclusion because you don't have enough information. They don't give it to you. Right. Well, I mean, I guess at a point it starts to feel like uh, technical jargon. I mean, I guess it's just a, you know, a preference. But it's sort of the same to me in like spy thrillers or anything like this. It's just, uh, yeah, I don't know. It's just... I feel like it, it's sort of, I feel like I'm watching a show where like a plumber just explains deeply in depth how plumbing works. It's just in this case, it's detective-y court stuff, but it doesn't mean anything to me. And after a while, I'm like, I can't connect these dots anymore. I don't know what's going on. 
So it's like one of these things like I respect this show, but I like the Defenders way more. I would watch the Defenders again. I feel like I'd, if I watch the other hundred Perry Masons, they're all going to be that. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Just different, different I details. I was impressed by how much uh, detail was in there. Right. You know, they, they had about five or six different scene changes, uh, road chases. Uh, well, that's where I presume, I mean, a lot of these uh, are based on, you know, when they got the rights to make this show, I was reading, they also got the rights to like 32 of the books. So, I mean, that's probably, this was probably a novel. So in a novel, yeah, you got time to unravel all this stuff, but that was, it felt like a dump truck of details <laughs> in a... Well, and Perry uh, in also in this... Most lawyers would, they yeah, they'd hire their private investigator guy, and he'd do all that checking around. But Perry himself went out and did all this stuff. He went to the motel. He went to the other hotel and checked out all this stuff. He went and investigated and uh, spoke with all these people. And rather than having his, his investigator, all he did, he checked out the gun. And he checked out uh, the divorce information on that actress and the marriage information on her. That's it. Perry went and did all the rest of that stuff. He was always on the road. <laughs> I don't know yeah. how he found time to uh, prepare for the case. And I can see why uh, they said in the little wiki article, like how ludicrously overworked Raymond Burr was for this nine year period, because yeah, it is like making a little mini movie every week and he's in every scene. Like, and that, that thing I was saying about how initially they pitched it as a broadcast live, man, what a nightmare yeah. to have to memorize a script that complicated and perform it live every week. Like, I'm glad they didn't even try. That would have been insane. Yeah, there's a lot of dialogue in that. I, I, I was very impressed with that, actually. <laughs> <laughs> or the other thing that makes me think of, uh, they didn't do it as much in original Star Trek, but in the later Star Treks, where they get into uh, the techno babble of like, hey, if we inverse the polarities of the uh, diffusion ray, like they're just saying things that don't mean anything. And I mean, they're not doing that here, but that's how it sounds to me. <laughs> You know, where I found the moral quandary of the defenders a lot easier for me to sink my teeth into because I understand, <laughs> you know. Yeah, and the defenders, based on the little bit of the research that you did, they would take like a, what is a moral issue yeah, and, and fight the legalities of it. This is a, an individual case. Yeah, it's like a lot more shallow. It's like, so a guy murdered another guy. We just got to figure out who and why. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Basically, where whereas the defenders is definitely issues that, uh, as we said, they're still issues today. Right. Fifty, sixty years later, those same issues that they address have never been resolved, and in our society, they are still issues. So one thing uh, with Perry Mason, though, that I also thought was interesting is I just presumed that it was. I, I always think of like the Mickey Spillane sort of Mike Hammer, the New York style, where you're in your tiny little office. And it's always just packed full of stuff. And then the dame comes in and, you know, the the cold streets of Brooklyn and Manhattan and the rain and whatever. And like that New York feel where I didn't realize this was the West Coast one. This is the Hollywood thing. And watching this made me realize how I've seen so many things with this exact setting and exact feeling. And now I know they're just ripping off Perry Mason because it's like all of the Hollywood crime stuff, uh, L.A. Confidential or uh, L.A. Noir or any of these, especially the ones that take place in this era, and they all got the same hats and they've all got the same cars and even the scenery of like the Hollywood mountains and the Hollywood backlots. It's just this. They're all just ripping off Perry Mason. <laughs> like I couldn't believe how incredibly identical the stuff I've seen from the 90s and the 2000s feels to this. It made me disappointed in them. It's like, you guys are just ripping off Perry Mason. <laughs> but I guess the New York ones do that too. Like everybody has the archetype and then yeah. they just... I can see why it became a very popular show with the viewing audience though. It, it's a show that definitely kept you guessing right. all the way through. As I say, some of the information <clears throat> was held back from us so that we couldn't figure it out. Uh, but it was still interesting enough to you know, it moved very quickly. It had all kinds of uh, evidence coming at you from all kinds of, and things that weren't explained. Like when he got out of the car and shot the gun into the post, you're like, what? Why would he do that? And then he makes, well, I figured out the notch on the gun pretty quick. I knew that they that there was going to be a switcheroo with the gun. 
but there was lots of that kind of stuff and it never dragged it was never I, I didn't find it boring at all well, I guess part of the problem, too, maybe, is just that because I'm coming at it from the other side, you know, it's not... If this was new on TV when I was a kid or whatever, or a teenager, I'd be like, awesome, this is cool. But since I'm coming at it from decades and decades of everyone Xeroxing this same idea over and over... So for me, I need things to be different. Like that movie Knives Out we watched, which was very similar. It's, you know, a, a murder mystery and you got to unravel what happened. But in Knives Out, they did that weird thing where the girl, the nurse, we see her actually poison the guy, or so we think. And, you know, it's not a mistake. She did do it. And then you got to figure out, well, now what does that mean? You know, that, that extra twist, where obviously in 1957, they weren't ready for extra twists yet. This was still new. <laughs> but when I watch it, I feel like, like it doesn't, I just don't feel like it's worth trying to keep up with the story because I'm not going to be able to anyway and then in the end it's just going to be boilerplate but it wasn't at the time so that's not a, yeah. a fair assessment that's just how I feel about it now but but uh, it is amusing how not only and, but this is formula Perry Mason not only does the accused the, the real person the killer or not only is he going to come clean at the end of the show but Perry actually grandstands in that courtroom. And I went here and I did this and we found out this and and you did this. And there's no way you could get away with that in a courtroom in the real world. But hey, it makes it pretty exciting viewing. And you got to squeeze something into You got one hour. And it's also, yeah, very convenient that the guy who actually did do the murder in this, he just hates his overbearing wife so much that he's willing to admit to a murder at the smallest provocation just to show her like, ha, see, I figured out a cool plan that was going to make me 10 grand. You think I'm so dumb? Well, I'm not because I did it. And then, oh, wait, I shouldn't yeah. have said that. Yeah it's, yeah, it's not just that I, not just that I did it, but, and I hate my wife and he tells you his whole life story. <laughs> And then, of course, they finish off with a nice ending at the end where any little holes that were left unanswered, Perry fills them all in. The other thing, I guess, that is also like it was just accepted at the time, but I feel like it's a, it's a, a worn out trope now, but it's uh, very similar to Nero Wolf. Remember how Nero Wolf was the most famous, most well known, you know, celebrity detective of, in all the world? Perry Mason isn't that famous but in local circles he's more than famous enough that a lady gets in trouble and she remembers she read an article about perry mason and every time he bumps into a movie star or something they're like oh you have fa famous perry mason yeah they all know him yeah. he's he, he's the man about town he's well known and then i feel he's like not just another lawyer <laughs> in like the 60s that that evolved into like the james bond thing and then batman was always kind of mm -hmm. like that too of just these like uh so, or Bruce Wayne or whatever, just so famous, so perfect, so known by everyone. And I feel like nowadays that kind of character is not, like no one buys that anymore. <laughs> well, no, because lawyers now, for the most part, have, have the bad rap. Like every every lawyer's kind of a crook and is going to take advantage of people and uh, pull fast ones in the court. Not Perry Mason. He's like the, the, the king of lawyers. He's, <laughs> well, he's, he's never going to pull a dirty, fast one on the court. It's going to be honesty and truth. That's what was weird, too, though, is like this lady comes in, you know, the standard, uh, you know, the dame. My, everything was going great till she walked through the door. This, this chick is a fucking walking disaster. She just got arrested recently for uh, jewelry yeah, theft yeah. that she didn't do, but then this all this gun stuff and then she she fires at a guy wildly and like realistically this is not a good case to take because i feel like in real life it, it, there's no way it would all come out so smoothly in the end that this lady is just the victim of horrible circumstance because where there's smoke there's fire this lady has got a fucked up life and that doesn't happen by accident <laughs> but here it does here oh, yeah and, and perry is uh He's always on the job. Yeah. I mean, it's the middle of the freaking night when she calls him because she's found this gun in her thing. He's at work, and he does go out, and but he'll be back in an hour. And I forget where he went now, but he was back when he when he called uh, his investigator to go and do some inspections, whatever. He's back. He's there all night, obviously, at his office. 
Well, I guess that's the thing too is, yeah, it's like this lady, her initial story is so suspicious and it's so unlikely that she's actually innocent. But it would be kind of interesting. Again, this is TV wasn't ready for this yet. This is my meta bullshit talking. But it'd be interesting if Perry Mason, maybe his character flaw is he'll take the case. Even if you seem really, really guilty, he'll take the case. But then they made nine seasons where the person was always innocent and Perry Mason always figured it out. Where wouldn't it be interesting if he always takes the shady case and then half the time it is shady for a reason and the person is guilty. <laughs> like that would still be interesting that he's for the sake of legal process, he'll take your case. But it's silly that every single person is innocent every fucking time. That's that's not good, you know. <laughs> but again, I, I'll give it a pass because it was the first one. Yeah. But you couldn't do that anymore. Yeah. And you want it for entertainment purposes. Right. And and then 10 years later, of course, you get the defenders. And, and they, because they took on moral issues, they, it, they became very controversial. Uh, Perry Mason, I bet if you did research on him, I bet there were no controversial cases that he dealt with. There is actually, though, a, uh, as I was looking stuff up, so there was the original Perry Mason. Then they tried another show with a different actor, but it didn't catch on. Then they did those movies with Raymond Burr again in the 80s, and they just started a brand new Perry Mason show this year. And uh, I bet dollars to donuts, all the stuff I'm saying is how it is, because that's just the style now is ambiguity, grayness. I'm sure it's a lot messier. And I didn't I hear somebody told me about that new Perry Mason. It's Perry Mason as a young, young lawyer starting out. Right. Before he gets a... Uh, Perry Mason year one. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> you know, just out of law school kind of thing. and. Uh, yeah, he's. it's a younger version of what we've seen here. So, I mean, I'm not interested enough to go dig it up and watch it, but I bet that's probably kind of the, the catch-22, though. If you make Perry Mason more ambiguous in all the shit I'm talking about, is it Perry Mason anymore? Could call it anything at that point, <laughs> you know? So who knows, but... Well, for entertainment value, um, I thought it was excellent. I'd, I'd give that a 10. And okay. yeah, it's worth it for me alone just to clear up this uh, Perry Mason Matlock confusion <laughs> and why that was mixed up in my brain. Like, and I think Matlock is very similar to that, isn't it? I think Matlock. Was, finished, uh, I've never seen very many of them, but they always seem to end up with the fact that Matlock always proves the innocence of these people. What, what's that guy's name? Andy. Uh, uh, Andy Griffith. Yeah, right. And yeah, it's just again uh, an old guy. The only reason I really know Matlock is it's Grandpa Simpson's favorite show. Everyone at the retirement home loves Matlock because he's the <laughs> old guy who gives everybody what for, you know, and proves that you can be an old guy and still, <laughs> still do things successfully. But I was going to say, as far as me confusing Matlock and Perry Mason, man, one that got me for probably 15 years is... Uh, Al Pacino and Robert De Niro because I just never was that into either of them I'm not like a huge fan of any of their movies even though they're famous and all their famous movies whatever I didn't realize they were two different people <laughs> when I realized that it blew my fucking mind I'm like wait a second the guy from Taxi Driver is not the guy from Scent of a Woman You're like oh shit <laughs> but again it's just because I just never never looked into it I never so yeah so that's another side benefit to this podcast is I can clear up the these things in my brain that I just didn't know that I didn't know. So uh, yeah, so for next week I'm not sure for certain what we'll do, but we got we got options. We got Matlock, we got Ironsides, we got yeah, we could just uh, jump ship to something and, and else. And they said Gunsmoke. Gunsmoke, yeah, I got I, I added it to my list, so we'll get there eventually. The other thing I don't know if we'll do an episode about it, but I'm curious kind of is since we've been doing these shows about uh, courtroom procedures, and maybe maybe we will do this just for the hell of it. Do you remember that sitcom Night Court? Oh, yes. Where yes. I'm just wondering, because I always liked it and stuff, and it seemed pretty <laughs> funny, but I never paid attention to the legal side of it. It must be complete nonsense, right? I'm sure they don't follow actual court procedure in the slightest in that show. And, and what even is night court? Like, night is it, court is, is like, well, we would call it our provincial court here. It's where uh, people get picked up for... I don't know, drunk driving, uh, running a stop sign. But you can't uh, wait till the next day? You need a night court? Well, they court? could, but they do night court so, because the courts are so full. Oh, it's, okay. it's at New York or someplace like that. The courts are so full uh, with regular type cases that they run a night court so that these people, if they're picked up in the night, they just, they, they're just processed. Rather than putting them in jail and taking up the state's 
money keeping them there and feeding them breakfast and all that stuff. You just bring them in, deal with them, get out. <laughs> yeah, so I don't know, maybe maybe just uh, for something a little lighter, maybe I'll yeah. dig up some Night Court just because... Yeah. Might not be bad to watch it. But and I, I, always, I, I always liked it as a sitcom, but I, I never considered, yeah, the actual legal due process in the slightest. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> um, I never thought about whether it really exists or not. But that might be something you might want to check out. Yeah, you know, look at I, there really are night courts, but that was there, the whole premise. There must be because why there, would they make that? Well, up? there probably are because if you think about it, why not? Why not? You, you the cops pick up somebody, bring them in right away, deal with them right away instead of putting them in jail and waiting for the morning and giving them the opportunity. Got to wait for him to call a lawyer, and the lawyer shows up down at the jail and deals with all that you know that would take hours and hours of processing work yeah just bring them in deal with them fine get a yeah it's just weird your money at the desk there buddy move on yeah because like it's not so weird for there to be a show about uh you know like the graveyard shift at a convenience store or something but you think of like low level workers or the people that are stuck doing graveyard shifts it's weird for the highfalutin court system to have the night yeah. version. <laughs> How do you even end up there? <laughs> but when you're in a in a city the size of New York, you've got so you've got millions, millions of people, and to to have to process them all in an eight hour time frame, eight to five or whatever, you you probably couldn't. Yeah, I guess it's true. All right. Well, I guess I'll dig into it a little more for next week, and we'll watch some Night Court. <laughs> <laughs>